welcome and thank you all for joining the fifth in a series of Senator Coast focused webinars informing and inspiring local clean energy development and resilience. In previous webinars, we've showed examples of microgrid projects. In this webinar, we'll address the question of how to plan and finance microgrid projects on government facilities. This webinar is brought to you by Uniting the Central Coast for Action, a growing coalition working to create a resounding voice for climate change and leadership and resilience on the Central Coast. My name is John Smigelski, and I'm a member of the Slow Climate Coalition leadership team and the webinar planning group, the United Central Coast for Action. Today, we have an exciting program for you with excellent speakers. First, we have Tom Willard, founder and CEO of Sage Energy Consulting, who will address how to plan and develop a microgrid project. Sage Energy has involved with a number of projects in our region. Tom will be fired by Peter Asmus, the executive director of the Alaskan Microgrid Group. Group Peter has been active in this area for decades. Peter will, be, uh, will advance, address financing options. He will also discuss relevant legislation, Senate, Senate Bill 833, the Community Energy Resilience Act of 2022. We will then shift to questions and answers. We request that you enter we request that you enter your questions in the chat during the presentation. We'll answer as many as we can after the speakers are done speaking, and we'll address any remaining questions in writing. After that, we'll take a few minutes to get your feedback on the webinar and other ways we can work together to develop local clean energy resilience. Before we, before we jump to the program, I'd like to thank our, all our fantastic partner organizations that helped make this webinar possible. We do appreciate their partnership and look forward to working together to accelerate climate change leadership and resilience in Central Coast. It's my pleasure to, to introduce Tom Willard, founder and CEO of Sage Energy. Tom, would you sh sh begin your presentation? Sure, All right. thanks John. Let me share my screen here. Okay, you all should see the uh, opening slide. So I'm Tom Willard. I'm with a company called Sage Renewable Energy Consulting, and we are actually now part of the NV5 family of companies since August of last year. So NV5 is an international engineering consulting firm in Sage, we work on renewable energy projects in the DER space. We also we work up into utility scale as well, but most of our projects are behind the meter commercial scale projects. And um, I'm going to be talking about how you go about just implementing a microgrid projects. So we have a number of these things we're working on right now, and I'll highlight just two of them at the end of the presentation. So the first thing that we do when we're working with our customers is we ask the question, hey, do you really need a microgrid? A lot of our customers come to us and say, hey, I think we want to do a microgrid. And so we start with, okay, what's the vision and mission of your organization? And what are the threats to your vision and mission from electrical outages? And what we find a lot of times is if this is a really an impactful electrical outage is impactful on your mission, you probably already have uh, like diesel generators in place. So that's the first place is a lot of times our customers don't need microgrids. And um, we talk with them about that. That's a really important place to, to focus. The next piece of this is again, scoping and planning is to identify your mission critical needs. So this is gonna be IT, medical, refrigeration, et cetera. It depends on what you are. You know, we have uh, tribal customers, for instance, that have uh, hotels and gaming casinos. And if the thing goes down for a day, they're out a million dollars. So that's, you know, that's a thing where we can say, hey, that's a million dollars a day. We can look at that and figure out what we need to do with the microgrid. And we do need to determine how long we need to run the grid when we need to run when the grid is down. And then that's, again, based on what your mission critical needs and loads are. Funding and financing, Peter's gonna cover this uh, later. There's a lot to say about that. And then project team. So 
microgrids are significantly more complicated than if you were just doing a solar PV project. It's, there's a lot more analysis that needs to be done to size the systems correctly and actually meet these mission critical needs. Oftentimes you need to actually do electrical engineering up front in the initial analysis project to understand what the costs are of re retrofitting existing buildings, for instance. So the project team's really important in, hey, we're a consultant that does this work. The reason we do this is that customers need this support. Um, let's see, next one, data collection. So now that you've decided to go for it and, and do this project, you need to go out and collect data. And uh, once we get all this data in, we can do what's called a value of resilience estimation. estimation. So we look at, hey, if you, if you go down, if your electricity goes down from the utility, what is the cost of that? And what is the value of maintaining resilience for a certain amount of time for, a very, for various different critical loads? That can be a really complicated analysis depending on the client and what you're looking at, um, but that's, that's an important piece of it so that you capture all the benefits of this because microgrids by themselves generally don't provide value, right? It's an uh, energy storage system or generation asset that's sitting there and it's just waiting for the grid to go down. So most of the time it's kind of a sunk cost. So understanding the full value of resilience is really an important aspect of it. Uh, electrical infrastructure, I mentioned that before. The important thing about that is most of these are being done as retrofits and the buildings that we're working with have not been designed to isolate the critical loads. And that means that there could be significant work with your um, electrical infrastructure on the building um, to actually support and you know, um, identify those critical loads and then isolate them in the critical load panel. That can be pretty costly. So retrofitting these things, electrical infrastructure is a really important piece of work to do up front. Um, existing generation, integrating that, what future plans you have with it, controls. Anyway, um, all of that is important. Um, and then grid reliability, it's possible that you can actually um, serve some grid needs with these things. Um, I'm just going to leave it to that, a lot longer conversation. Okay, the next thing is we come up with a conceptual design. So uh, we need to do the generation and storage analysis. If you have multiple assets, you might have a lithium ion battery or a flow battery. You might have generation assets, existing generators, there are diesel generators out there or some combination. That all needs to be designed and modeled and, and modeled very well in order to understand how these things are gonna perform when the grid goes down. So um, as part of this, we look at implementation options, how you could go about purchasing it. Um, and I'll go a little bit into that later. Again, financing options, lots of them. Peter's gonna talk about that. Uh, and financial physical performance modeling. So at the end of the day, we need to know, will it meet the requirements? And what is the financial impact of this. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, many of these projects are put together with solar PV and battery storage. The solar PV usually provides almost all of the financial lift associated with these projects. So let's see. Next part is the procurement and financing. So you need to figure out how you're gonna go build this thing. So there are many different strategies out there. Um, so for solar and battery projects, mostly for commercial customers, we see this done as design build. So you put out basically a performance spec out to the market, vendors come back and say, here's what we think we can do. And then the vendor does the final detailed design on the project. In the case of microgrids, due to the interaction with you know, your uh, critical circuits and retrofits of critical circuits and switchgear in existing buildings, a lot of times we're pushed more toward a design bid build in a scenario where we're actually providing hard design and looking for a vendor to come in and do the construction and purchasing of this. So that's one of the subtleties. If you're used to using design builds, 
microgrids might force you more towards a design bid build delivery method. Funding and financing, that's Peter. Um, we always suggest doing a competitive procurement um, and going through vendor selection. I've got a little table there on the left, which is the various different criteria and the weighting of each one and the scoring of each one. So this is one of the things that we do when we go out to, to bid. We take in all of the vendors' proposals and we do both qualitative and quantitative analysis on them. And that all rolls up into a scoring matrix, which I haven't shown, but this shows you the various different criteria and weightings of those different criteria, which is pretty difficult. Um, so that's vendor selection. The last piece is contracting. So this is once you've selected a vendor, you actually have to go through and get the contract signed. And um, so what Sage does is we actually sit down shoulder to shoulder with your attorneys and go through those contract documents to make sure that the technical pieces of it that the attorneys don't know about, they don't understand, you know, financing and implica implications of various financings on these energy projects. They don't understand the technical details of how do you do a performance guarantee and things like that. So we, uh, we do a lot of work with the attorneys on the contracting phase. Okay, um, once you've got a signed contract, we then go into the, what we call the implementation phase. And each one of these bullets here is a separate piece of implementing a project. So the first piece of it is design review. And that's a really important piece because after the sales guys have signed that contract, they throw it over the fence to the design team and everything you just did for the last two months or three months with them goes out the window. So you have to sit down with the design team and make sure that they understand exactly what the project criteria are and constraints and really walk them through. So we do it. There's a lot of work right there to bring the design team up to speed and make sure they're really on it. And then there's construction oversight, commissioning oversight, project closeout. You know, the last 5% of these projects, getting them closed out is often the hardest thing to do because the vendors want to get out and get on to the next one. And then there's operations and maintenance. So these projects don't work without operations and without maintenance. So there should be a maintenance agreement in place. We have yet to find a customer who really has the actual expertise in-house on staff to provide adequate maintenance. So we always recommend that you go out and have a maintenance contract with a performance guarantee built in. And then you have oversight of that. You, that's just not enough by itself. You have, to have, you have to look at those contracts and make sure that they're happening. Okay, my last slide, just a couple of quick overview. We're doing a bunch of these projects. I've listed a couple of them here, which are somewhat well-known. So on the left, there's Santa Barbara USD, and they're doing a solar storage and microgrid project. Um, it's 14 district sites, four and a half megawatts of solar PV batteries and microgrids at six of the sites. And we went through all of this analysis and we're going through, we're actually finalizing construction on a number of the sites right now. Um, and we're, we're thinking that the, the project itself is about a $40 million project. And we're expecting it to save about $8 million over 28 years. And that's including the cost of maintaining those microgrids at the six sites, which are basically their big high school sites. And they have some critical loads. It's primarily food storage that they want to maintain. Um, they're in uh, a load pocket there, which is not well supplied by electricity. And so there's some, there is some risk of electricity going down. On the right-hand side, City of Gondolas, these people are awesome. So the city of Gonzales is a little nine, 10,000 person city in the, um, down near Salinas off of 101. Um, they are doing a microgrid project for their industrial park. So their industrial park includes primarily major food service companies that have industrial operations in Gonzales. And the issue is that pg e does not have enough power to serve the full build out of the industrial park. And to get pg e to do that, it would have, it's gonna take four or five years anyway. They actually need to bring down 
new transmission uh, capacity, and it's just not going to happen in any anytime soon. So the city decided to go out, stand up their own municipal utility, and create their own microgrid for this entire business park. It's a big deal. It's a huge lift. It's 14 megawatts of PZV. It's about 40 megawatt hours of storage and 10 megawatts of gas fired generation. Um, and they, we've done everything from soup to nuts. So we're building this whole utility from ground up and you know the rules, the tariffs, the customer forms, we're doing the oversight, we're doing managing of the cost of service, pro forma, you name it. So that's on sort of the larger end of a microgrid. Um, and there are quite a few other projects we're doing. I just wanted to give you a little spectrum of what we're looking at. And that's what I've got for today. Thank you, Tom. Um, one of the things you've mentioned is the, 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 the need to value resilience and how important that is. Um, I understand from, we had a presentation from the Santa Barbara Unified School District and they achieved their savings without um, uh, counting resiliency. And I guess the issue is, it's load shaping, it's the saving some solar, et cetera, to kind of make the project work even without a resiliency adder, is, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we did do a value of resiliency analysis, a pretty significant one there. At the end of the day, the number that I put up there, that $8 million savings does not include the value of resilience um, that we think that the project's providing. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and now I, I would like to introduce, um, you can stop sharing. And um, Peter, if you could uh, start sharing your screen. And I'd like to introduce Peter Asmus, Executive Director of the Alaskan Microgrid Group, to talk about financing. So um, I'm going to kind of go some big picture stuff. Until recently, I was with a company called Guidehouse Insights, formerly Navigant Research. So while there, we actually were the first ones to try to size and forecast the microgrid market, always a dangerous thing to try to do, but that's what we did. So I'm going to start off with some forecasts here. You know, this might not mean too much to you. It, it does show that despite all of the problems. And of course, this forecast was developed before some of the more recent uh, changes that Tom was just talking about. But you can see that in the US, the forecasts show um, over a thousand megawatts of microgrid capacity coming online this year. And you can see it's this kind of classic hockey stick uh, where we're imagining that the market will continue to grow at the 16.2%. Um, Com, um, compounded annual growth rate. So that's just to let you know that, you know, this is a sizable market. Although when I showed this to some uh, South Korean company recently who wanted to enter the U.S. market, they thought, oh, that's tiny. So it's all a matter of perspective. Um, this next thing is also some data from what we call the uh, microgrid deployment tracker. I was the one who first put this together. It's always incomplete. The challenge with microgrids is there's really, um, first of all, is it really a microgrid? Tom kind of asked that question, but even in the industry, a lot of people now like to call their projects microgrids when they might not technically meet the Department of Energy official uh, definition. Um, there's also kind of a debate between backup generation versus a microgrid. Um, for example, here you see in terms of projects, Florida, Number one, which I was quite surprised with, but that's mainly one company called Power Secure, whose most of their microgrids are diesel based. Now they do meet the DOE definition of a microgrid because they can operate what's called in parallel with the grid. Uh, but you can see California comes in number three, according to this data, um, in terms of projects. But if you look at capacity, California comes in number two. Number one is Alaska, and that's one reason I recently joined this Alaska microgrid group, because it is the number one state, but in Alaska, it's a very different market than California, where the majority of those projects are not connected to any grid, because most of Alaska 
um, there's only like a, a very limited transmission system there. But even within that transmission system, there's a number of microgrids. So this is just kind of show you different states. Um, you know, no surprise. If you look at capacity, the top five there, you know, that doesn't surprise me that much. Texas a little bit, but most Texas microgrids also are fossil fuel based, unlike California's. So now we're going to talk about um, business models. So part of what I have to do at Guidehouse is we tracked and we divided the microgrid market into these broad sort of segments here. Um, I'll define them on the next slide, but you can see over time that the most popular business model in the U.S., and this is also true globally, is this idea of energy as a service. And I'll be talking um, about that in more detail here in a second. But here are the um, main four categories. The most simplest is just owner financing. It just means the person who has the microgrid pays for it. Um, this was really common in a lot of early generation microgrids at college campuses because those institutions actually had energy managers and so they had enough expertise, although a lot of those were more kind of like combined heat and power microgrids, fairly simple, only one generation source in some cases. Um, so that's one way to go. Um, a lot of commercial and industrial CNI microgrids can also be financed this way, especially by larger companies. But as microgrids become more complex, this approach is less appealing because it's not as simple. So new microgrids tend to almost always have energy storage. They could have two, three, even four kinds of generation, for example. So that's becoming less popular. Utility rate basing, that's the way most of our infrastructures traditionally been financed, but it's not really a great fit for microgrids, except those remote systems like in Alaska, where basically the whole utility is a microgrid. The key challenge is, do the benefits of a microgrid flow to a select few or all of the ratepayers served by the utility? That's why a lot of the utilities, or not a lot, but several have been rejected when they tried to use this um, methodology. The most successful ones are what's called non-wires alternatives, like in California, San Diego Gas and Electric did the Borrego Springs project, where essentially the argument was a microgrid was a cheaper way to provide the, the electricity than traditional transmission system upgrades. Government funding, we all like it when the government funds microgrids. Um, since 2011, a number of states have created a microgrid program that started with Connecticut due to some of the hurricanes. Um, also, utilities often do receive government funding as well to sort of try out new technologies, but as the market matures, um, there's probably gonna be less government funding over time, at least direct government funding. Some of the incentives that Tom was talking about, we're kind of considering separately. So an incentive for solar or the incentives in California for storage, those are key things, but I'm talking more about where a government pays for an entire microgrid. And then the last category here is the energy as a service concept. It comes in many formats. It really sort of leans on the lessons learned from uh, solar leasing. That's what kind of drove the solar PV market. That's actually ironically becoming a little less popular now as the cost of solar come down. So, um, but that's really this whole idea of the customer receives the benefits in the case of a microgrid resilience and cleaner power without the risk of actually project performance. Of course, this puts a lot of um, risk at the vendor, and it really depends a lot on the microgrid controller, which is, I always argue, is the most critical uh, technology in microgrids. So those are a lot of the options here. I'm not gonna go through all of this detail here. You will have these slides, but here it sort of compares um, energy as a service, utility, rate pacing, owner financing. Like I said, I don't think I have really time to dig into this. But um, I wanted to spend um, some more time here. Now, this is uh, people look at this and they still don't understand what it says. But this is uh, from Schneider Electric. I've done a number of white papers with Schneider Electric, big, large French company. They've sort of been the pioneer on the energy as a service concept. Now, some of the other companies like Siemens, which were another big vendor, was skeptical at first now they're saying you have to have an energy as a service offer out there. 
So again, Schneider Electric here is really the technology provider. They're not actually the owner of the project. The owner of the project could be a variety of ent entities here. You see Duke Energy, a utility there, the very first microgrid, which we're going to talk about here in more detail in a second, was actually financed by the unregulated arm of Duke Energy. You see the Carlisle Group here. That's another big investment firm as a partnership with Schneider called Alpha Structure. They're doing like huge microgrids like JFK Airport. I believe it's a series of microgrids. But this just shows you it's sort of a conceptual way of showing how Schneider Electric looks at this. And you can see on the bottom, that's what a local government would be interested in. Higher reliability, resilience, no capital expense, increased sustainability, infrastructure improvements, more predictable energy costs, and then a, a public-private partnership business model. So here is the specific project, Montgomery County, Maryland. It's actually two different microgrids. Um, Duke Energy Renewables was the investor. Um, they had a, a number of power outages. Um, also due to hurricanes, they didn't have enough money themselves to pay for the microgrid. They weren't that interested in owning the system themselves. So here you can see um, the assets that are rolled into the microgrid. On the right, you have two megawatts of solar, two megawatts natural gas, 2.55 megawatt legacy diesel generators, a megawatt CHP. Interestingly, there is no storage in this microgrid, which is relatively rare these days. Um, and also part of the um, value proposition was infrastructure upgrades. And so here, again, you can see energy as a service, no cost to the um, host, I guess you could call it. Um, there are some unique structures here in some of these contracts. I mean, in many ways, what these contracts are doing is mimicking what we've always done with utilities, except it's not a utility provider, it's a third party. In essence, you're paying off the microgrid through operational uh, expenses as opposed to a capital cost. Now here, revenue streams, uh, this microgrid can capture revenue streams from the provision of grid services. That's another thing microgrids can do if the market allows it. Right now in California, that's very difficult to do um, just because of uh, the telemetry requirements, the grid operator, uh, imposes upon microgrids. There's actually a program that would allow microgrid as small as 500 kilowatts to sell into the wholesale market, but not one entity, as far as I know, has ever used that program. And then here are the benefits on the bottom. You can see produces about 80% of the energy um, needed, reduces greenhouse gases. And here's a biggie for the county. It avoided a $4 million capital expense uh, for um, upgrades. And there's, uh, you're locked into energy prices for 25 years under this model. So what I wanted to, so that's about energy as a service. I will say it's not like, it sounds too good to be true and it's not gonna always work in every occasion. It's always gonna be the devil in the details. And really to even get to the, point of wanting to do an energy as a service, you're going to have to do a lot of the um, feasibility studies and stuff that, that Tom spoke about. I did do a white paper with Schneider Electric right before I left Guidehouse Insights. It's called the Hows and Whys of a Smart Microgrid Feasibility Study. And that can be downloaded from their site. I think we'll include some of that information as a follow-up. But here I wanted to talk about um, this legislation. And this is really what every local government in California should support. It's SB 833. Uh, last year, there was a similar bill. It was called SB 99. It sailed through the legislature and then died mysteriously at the very end of the session. And so now um, the Climate Center, which is sponsoring this legislation, is back with this bill. Um, it's also a companion measure called AB 2665. So the idea is that it's supposed to allow local governments in collaboration with utilities to create energy resilience plans, which then are based on clean energy microgrids. So it's in essence a planning tool. One reason utilities have opposed microgrids by third parties 
is they complain that they don't know where they're going to go. They just sort of pop up like mushrooms on the system. You know, they can't control them. And so this kind of deals with that, but it's really looking at it from a local government perspective. You know, where would that microgrid make the most sense from the local government's point of view, as well as the utilities point of view? The good news, the bill did pass unanimously out of the Senate Energy Committee on March 14th. Here's a link to um, where you can sign up to support it. The bill, um, I believe uh, also the Climate Center is pushing some actual numbers behind this bill. So for example, they're saying there's also a way of creating a line item in the energy package that's being debated in the budget. So what they're proposing is $200 million for community energy resilience planning, $800 million for community energy resilience project implementation. And so here's a list of all of the supporters of that legislation. So, and then I wanted to briefly mention that um, this new group I'm a part of, um, the Alaska Microgrid Group, why would anyone in California care about what Alaskans think? Well, for one, I'm still in California. I'm the new executive director. So the idea is that they want to export their expertise to the rest of the country, but also help people find projects in Alaska. So um, a lot of these, ironically enough, are utilities. So that's where the microgrid market in, in Alaska is very different, is that most of the innovation is actually coming from these utilities because the microgrid is all they have. And there are a number of microgrids there that have operated on 100% renewable energy. But on the other hand, the other thing about Alaska microgrids is these have to work. So they cannot take risks. If a microgrid fails, people literally freeze to death during certain times of the year. I was told when one microgrid failed, it took them three months to get fresh water back because all of the pipes froze. So here you can see some of the services. Uh, I'm adding this bottom one, case studies and thought leadership. That's really my area of expertise. Most of the other folks are more technical uh, than I am. And here is my contact information. Um, so we, we did have a few questions that were asked in, in the chat. Um, first, I'd like to um, point out that uh, Gregory Young of the Clean Coalition, or related to the Clean Coalition, uh, points out that um, for value of resiliency methodology, uh, there's been some work done by the Clean Coalition on that. And if you're interested in seeing that, and uh, there's a link that Greg put into the chat. So just check in there. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm not sure if this is really going to be for Tom or for Peter. So gentlemen, please jump in. Um, this comes from Brett Garrett. Uh, is there any requirement for new buildings to be designed to isolate critical loads? Um, not that I'm aware of in any of the markets that we're serving. No, I don't think there's any requirements for that. I think there's greater interest in it. And I, I just wanted to make one quick comment about the value of resiliency. I know that a lot of people have asked about that. In fact, there was a conference a few years ago. It, it was microgrid knowledge. There's, I'm going to be speaking at that conference. It's coming up in Philadelphia. It's the biggest microgrid event in the U.S. And there was consensus that we needed a value for resilience, but there was a total lack of consensus on how to create those values. And I think that's the challenge is that um, some of the early studies, I know um, NRAIL did an experiment looking at two different military bases to try to calculate the value of resilience. And they basically said every single microgrid actually probably has a different value of resilience if you really want to be academic or technical about it. And of course, that's not going to work if you need to have a whole year-long study for every microgrid to figure out what that value of resilience is. But it is not zero. And it's true that today, most microgrids have to make economic sense without actually capturing the value of their prime defining feature. But the other thing I would say is the reason why we're seeing that commercial and industrial customers are now the fastest 
growing market, at least that's what I said when I was with Guidehouse, and I believe it's true, is because they actually have an internal value of resilience because if they suffered through power outages or PSPS events, they actually know how much money they lost. So they kind of have an internal mm-hmm. metric saying, okay, we lost, I think Tom said, like, if you lost a million dollars over a year, you know, that will then motivate you to say, well, I need to invest in some, well, backup generation or a microgrid. And the one, of course, as we ratchet down on the emissions, and in California, we actually have mandates to meet climate change goals, you know, the attractiveness of a backup generator becomes less over time because you can only use it when the power goes out, whereas a microgrid, if you have other cleaner assets, you can still utilize some of the value from it when um, the grid is up and running. Okay, excellent. Thanks for uh, for that added information about uh, value of resilience. And then we have a, a question that's, um, uh, it's, I think it's really kind of forward looking here. And this has to do with uh, vehicle to grid implementations. This comes from Barry Rands, who I know spends a lot of time looking at this topic. And Barry wrote, seems like we really need to push for uh, vehicle to grid implementation pronto so that we can use all the existing EV batteries in our home storage and larger microgrids. So I'm uh, curious, uh, both Tom and Peter, if you have an opinion about the potential for the use of um, vehicle to grid or for that matter, vehicle to building or vehicle to home capabilities to tap into the energy stored in electric vehicles. Peter, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? I'm sure we both have opinions about that. And, and let me yeah, add, well, this would be in the context of microgrids. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, well, I don't know. Well, Tom, let's, I'll let you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say uh, yes. So um, my personal opinion is that the, the actual adoption rates for EVs are going to be somewhat slower than some of the earlier studies that we saw come out uh, for a number of reasons. There are market reasons behind that. Um, there are also just challenges in upgrading and fitting out the distribution networks to actually manage that. So there's a lot of And Barry knows this, (laughs) there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to do vehicle to grid. We need vehicles that do it. We need software that manages um, the load on the on the vehicle and on the house. Um, There is some legislation and certainly in a number of states that needs to be um, worked through the, you know, like the public utility commissions to allow interconnection of these assets. Um, It's a really big lift. I don't think we're going to see it happen very quickly. Um, But yes, there's going to be a lot of capacity in EVs out there. And um, it would be, and I imagine will be, something that will be tapped into in the future. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think conceptually it makes a lot of sense in microgrids, but also more broadly. I mean, one of my other new jobs and a hat I wear is with a company called AutoGrid, which is more about virtual power plants where that's where they're focused on fleets. And that's where the first sort of applications will be our actual fleets and larger vehicles like buses. So for example, AutoGrid has a plan with a company called Zoom, not like Zoom as in what we're using right now, but um, Z-U-M is how it's spelled, to basically um, manage the charging of um, electric buses in the Oakland area. And their plan over four years is to provide a gigawatt of capacity. That's a thousand megawatts of capacity to the grid. Now that's pretty speculative and that's also kind of a a high mark they're aiming for. So that's one option. But there have been EVs plugged into microgrids in California on a more experimental basis at some military bases. The military is very interested in sort of using some larger sort of military vehicles, their EV batteries as a resiliency resource. Uh, But it's true that it's going to take a while. I know that there's some small companies out there 
um, that are, are working on this, waiting to get UL certified. The other issue in California is uh, more in terms of providing grid services is um, there isn't a current market. There is one program, an experiment, like a kind of a demand response program, where now they are allowing EVs as a kind of last resort grid resource. But again, that's experimental. But I was just in L.A., um, was it last week or the week before, where the Department of Energy is very big. They're calling it V to X. So they're not saying it's V to grid anymore. It's mm -hmm. V to everything. And SMUD was there, all the California utilities. So there is um, a lot of interest on leveraging this resource. It's just got a ways to go. So I think it's one thing about your own home, the possibility of, of leveraging some EV battery for your own resilience. But the main commercial opportunity in the near term will be fleets. The other advantage of that is buses, you know, they have a schedule. So, you know, that bus will be parked at a certain point. So you can count on that. That's also a much larger battery. So that's why I think it's going to be EV fleets is where that's going to start. I'm going to bring in Barry Rands, who asked the question, um, give him an opportunity to um, do a follow on question or comment. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, it, it, it seemed like the uh, one of the ideas that was or the one of the problems with this uh, is uh, the slow rate of EV adoption. But it seems to me that, uh, well, um, if you there's certain microgrids that could be designed where uh, V2G is is one of the main power sources or one of the main storage sources. And, and it, it just the whoever, uh, whatever the entity, a hospital or whatever, they just make the decision, all of our fleet cars, um, and uh, we're gonna give incentives to employees to, you know, to drive EVs or whatever, you know, so that, that it is designed into the system. And there, I, I know there's enough EVs out there that already are V2G capable, especially the Nissan Leafs, um, where it seems, seems to me that we should be um, pushing this a little bit more aggressively. Yeah, well, I would agree with you. And in fact, the Climate Center, which I mentioned is behind the legislation, is very interested in this issue, particularly uh, there, the way they look at it is instead of relying on diesel generators, for backup power, we've got a million EVs in California that have been sold so far. So there is interest. There are projects where EVs have been integrated into microgrids, as I mentioned. I, I don't have that list right in front of me, but there have been projects where that has been done. So I would imagine we're going to hear more about that in the near future. Good, good. And and the reason that that it prompted my comment was was the uh, the problem with the battery shortages and and all that sort of thing and it just really uh grieves me that uh, tesla is selling so many power walls when uh they've got so many evs out there that could could serve um you know their ev batteries are are seven times as large as their power walls and and they don't allow <laughs> v2g with their their teslas yeah, yeah. I, I don't think Tesla actually has the hardware in place with their current cars to do that. Right. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll just tack on a comment there by saying that, you know, um, Ford is really promoting um, vehicle to home charging with their F-150 Lightning, which should be shipping very soon. And, you know, as a homeowner, whose roof is not suitable for solar because of its complexity and the proximity of some shade trees. Um, you know, it doesn't, I'm looking at that possibility myself of, you know, in the future being able to use an, an EV to provide emergency power should the grid go down. Okay. So uh, there are probably a few more people like me, but I believe that's some, um, that's, I'm sorry, I'm just checking back in the some of the questions here. Yeah, I think it, at this point, maybe we'll close the, um, the Q&A section. And I'd like to thank our speakers, first of all, for having given excellent presentations and then also answering these questions on the fly. And then um, I'm going to bring in Nancy Glock-Gruenike, 
who's going to solicit some feedback for what we can do in future webinars. And then I believe John will be closing the webinar after Nancy finishes. So please, everybody stick around to, you know, let us know what, what you think. Nancy, are you ready? I am indeed, thank you. Um, this has been really, really interesting. I'm here to connect this up to the next webinar we'll be doing. This is a series that um, Yuka has uh, put on for a number of months now on distributed energy. And we're particularly interested in aiding local municipalities and electeds to see the future and figure out how to step into it. We're also interested in the public's better understanding of what these potentials are. So for example, the topic we were just talking about is pretty exciting. The public could probably get really interested in it, learn something of it, and we might do a webinar in it. So what I wanted to ask those of you who've been here today is feedback on what we've done today, but in, in particular, what topics you would like to see in the future? Who should we be targeting? Who should be invited? So if there's some questions or comments or thoughts about that, that would be really helpful at this point. And Nancy, I believe you wanted them to be communicated via chat. Is that correct? Uh, either right now. I'm, I'm taking notes. Uh, if someone just wants to speak up, that would be great. If okay, you we, can put them in chat. Have, we have the audience muted um, oh, to, well, then to that prevent would, background thank, noise. Okay. Then I guess chat is what we're, what we're looking for. So, um, yeah, so put the information in chat. I, I too want to thank the speakers. I, I, and, um, you know, there's some, some real topics that come up that really need to kind of be addressed. You know, these supply chain issues, how temporary are they? Will they, you know, will the trend and decrease in prices go down? Will batteries prices go up? Um, just how do we figure out res value of resiliency? You know, it's easy for a gambling casino to figure out the cost of resiliency, but a hospital, uh, a daycare center, you know, where the value is not necessarily with people who are um, operating facility. And just how do we figure that out and make it work? Because um, I'm not sure that our grid in California is getting any better. Uh, and uh, the things we've seen the last few summers are going to repeat and they're going to be places that it didn't happen last time. But I thank you for the thought provoking um, discussion. Okay. John, let me step in with one other thing I kept thinking about is there were a number of impediments and there were new uh, bills before the state legislature. But I'm particularly interested in where if the public were better informed on the potential, what might we do to help get the impediments removed? And if the speakers have ideas about that or others, I'd like to hear them. And if there are others who want to put any ideas in chat with our last couple of minutes. Good, great. And I also want to thank the, uh, the team that puts on this webinar, includes Nancy, and uh, Mark, as, long, as well as uh, June Cochran and Jill Samick, and I appreciate their efforts. And yes, it's Bill 833 is one of those bills that require support for everyone. You see all the organizations that signed up for it, including the Civil Climate Coalition and a few others on this call. Um, legislation is a difficult process in, in California, and we need to move it forward. 